Is my, my microphone working? Everybody hear me? Great. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here tonight and um, a delight and an honour for me to be able to come and speak to you and I thank you for your very kind invitation so to do. And I want over the uh, course of the, the five lectures I'm giving, hopefully, to whet your appetites for going off and reading John Owen for yourself. Um, there is always a question uh, when it comes to historical issues as to why one should bother, why is this particular person relevant? Well, how on earth can somebody who lived uh, three, four hundred years ago possibly speak to the present day? Well, my own uh, introduction to John Owen came through the book Knowing God by James Packer that I think I can safely say has influenced and impacted, I see people nodding already, uh, influenced and impacted many people. And James Packer's book, Knowing God, is little more in some ways than a simplification and a slight update of a series of sermons that John Owen gave at the University of Oxford in the 1650s that he gave to an assembly of students there. And it's amazing, but perhaps no surprise, that the problems students faced in Oxford in the 1650s, no different from the problems that students face in many days, the start of the 21st century um, if I were to say money, sex and alcohol were the things that were the problem in Oxford in the 1650s, you see that it's pretty much that way today. So, John Owen then, an extremely relevant theologian, I think. But this first lecture, what I want to do is set some of the context for understanding Owen. Uh, no man occurs in a vacuum. We're all, to a large extent, shaped by the context and the background into which we are born. And if you want to understand Puritan theology in general, and John Owen in particular, you need to understand something about the England and the Europe in which he was brought up. His dates are 1616 to 1683. So he's a man of the 17th century. He's somebody who lived during what is arguably the most turbulent century in English history. Uh, as in all things, the English tend to invent things and the Americans then do it bigger and better than we did. We invented civil wars. We had one in the 17th century. You had a bigger and more impressive one in the 19th century, but we did get there first. And John Owen was a significant player in the world of the English Civil War and the post-Civil War. And that is important to understanding where he's coming from. We'll come to that a bit, little bit later. Even more important, however, for Owen, is the background of the European Reformation of the 16th century. And we need to spend a few minutes this evening thinking about exactly what the Reformation did, what kind of a world that created into which this man was born and in which he lived. We can be very blasé, I think, about the Reformation. We can think we've understood it and we have not really often wrestled with the full enormity and impact of what was going on at the time of the Reformation. If we go back to Martin Luther, Martin Luther's burning question is, how can I find a gracious God? The issue for Martin Luther is, how can I be assured that God is gracious to me? That is a very radical question in the 16th century because it was not a question that medieval theologians cared to ask. Medieval theology was set up in a very, very different way. When Luther raises his protest against the Roman Church and when Luther places the question of the believer's assurance at the centre of uh, Christian theology, two things happen that are very, very important. First of all, what happens is the bar on Christian experience is raised incredibly high. Prior to Martin Luther, prior to the Reformation, assurance was not an issue. Being concerned about your status before God was what kept you a good member of the church. You were baptised, you were confirmed, you continued to take the Mass regularly, when you died you would have holy unction and you would hope for the best that you would make it into heaven, providing you had done all of these things. Luther sets up the question very, very differently. 
Luther wants to place at the heart of the Christian life not uncertainty about how one stands before God, but absolute certainty of how one stands before God. For medieval Catholicism, uh, one does good deeds in order to have a good chance at the end of time. For Martin Luther and for Protestantism, one does good deeds out of a grateful reaction to what God, what you know God has already done for you. So, first thing that follows from Luther's uh, uh, protest, if you like, is that the bar on Christian experience is raised very, very high. At the same time, however, the Reformation sweeps away everything with which we people were familiar. In the 16th and 17th century, the world is changing rapidly. Middle Ages, society was pretty much an agrarian society, we would say. It was a society built upon agriculture. It was a society where people grew up, were born, lived, married and died in the same communities. My wife comes from an island off the northwest coast of Scotland. She is the first of her generation who really moved away from the island and married somebody that she hadn't met by the time she was five. Previous generations, the chances were, in her society, you'd have met your future spouse by the time you were five. You may not have known they were your future spouse, but you'd probably have come across them. What has happened to her island in the 20th century was happening all over Europe in the 16th. The world is becoming a much more uncertain place. And at the same time, of course, the Reformation sweeps away everything with which people are familiar church-wise. The Mass doesn't look like it used to look like anymore. Words are being said to you in the vernacular, words you can understand. Priests have gone, the confession has gone. Confession has gone. Everything that you relied upon for security and stability in your life has been swept away at precisely the same moment that the church is saying your Christian experience, the bar has to be set that much higher. So the first thing I want you to, to sort of grasp hold of tonight is how unsettling a world it was in which people like John Owen were engaged in pastoral ministry. There were new questions being generated by the changes, intellectual and social, all around them. There were new disturbances in society. John Owen, many of his ideas, and some of them we will touch upon this weekend, wrote some fairly rarefied theological works, some fairly complicated theological works. But at the end of the day, he was a man wrestling with pretty basic pastoral issues and situations. And it's important, first of all, to understand that that is where Owen is coming from. So the first thing then, the pastoral situation is that much more complicated than it used to be. Second, and more specific to England, is the issue of worship. What should worship look like? At the time of the Reformation, the Reformers are very, very concerned that the old Latin liturgies and the old Latin form of the service, Roman Catholic service, is transformed, needs to be in the vernacular. If justification is by faith and faith is belief in a promise, then the promise needs to be declared in a way that people can understand. There's no point in me promising something to you in a language you don't speak. My wife's a Gallic speaker. She could stand up to here tonight and she could read a passage in the Scriptures to you in Gallic and you wouldn't know if it was Old Testament or New Testament. She could promise you the world and you wouldn't know what she was saying to you. The liturgy needs to be put across in English. So all over Europe, as Protestantism makes its impact upon society, the form of worship is being transformed. It's being put into vernacular. In Germany, it's being put into German. In France, it's being put into French. In Holland, it's being put into Dutch. In England, it's being put into English. And questions arise of what exactly should this new worship look like? The change isn't just, at the end of the day, a language change, if you like. There are also questions of theology. If the Mass is no longer about an offering to God, but becomes the Lord's Supper, something that brings the promise to a congregation, then the words that surround the Lord's Supper have to change as well. The position of the Lord's Supper in the service has to change as well. 
So a whole host of questions are thrown up on the matter of Christian worship. And in England, they take on a peculiarly political form. The Reformation in England is very much a parliamentary-driven thing. King wants to break with the Roman Catholic Church primarily because he wants a divorce. And the Pope has already granted him a special dispensation to marry the woman he married, Catherine of Aragon, doesn't want to grant him a certificate of divorce because Catherine of Aragon is related to the Holy Roman Emperor. And the Pope doesn't want war with the Holy Roman Empire, so he won't grant Henry VIII his divorce. So Henry VIII decides to cut the church off, effectively. That's a rather sim- simplified narrative, if you like, but at the end of the day, Henry VIII breaks with the Roman Catholic Church in England in the 16th century because he requires a divorce. Parliament, the equivalent, if you like, in Britain of the, you know, the House Senate and the House of Representatives, then sets about putting into place a form of worship for the church in England. And a man called Thomas Cranmer, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury, produces something called the Book of Common Prayer. It goes through two editions, 1549 and 1552. And the Book of Common Prayer is a great idea because it contains such good theology in its liturgy that any priest who's literate can use it. When you think about the Reformation, the Reformation doesn't just sweep away everybody who was a priest. You've got to work with what you've got. Most of the priests stayed in place. What you've got to make sure is that what they're giving their people is sound theology. So what Parliament does is it produces a Protestant book that any priest who's literate can read in his service and give his people good Protestant theology. Well, over the period of Uh, the next hundred years, the Book of Common Prayer changes its function somewhat. When it's produced at the Reformation, it's produced, one might say, as a way of liberating people. It's produced as a way of bringing Protestantism to bear on the people. But there are aspects of the Book of Common Prayer that upset certain Protestants. Most famously, a man called John Knox, the leading Scottish reformer. One of the things that upsets him is the fact that when you take communion, you have to kneel. And Knox sees kneeling at communion as a sign that you're worshipping the bread and the wine. Cranmer didn't think you were worshipping the bread and the wine, but he kept the kneeling in because he didn't want to disturb people more than he had to. And what I said earlier on about how disturbing the Reformation was. Knox was very upset about this. And it becomes a major point at issue between the government and many of the ministers in the church. The role of the Book of Common Prayer. And this is where Puritanism, one might say, is born. What is Puritanism? The Puritans were those Anglican ministers, ministers of the Church of England, who were disillusioned with the final Reformation settlement of Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer. They were those who saw the Common Prayer, Book of Common Prayer as only a halfway Reformation. Wished to see a more thorough reform of worship. They objected to kneeling. They objected to various aspects of the book. And from, really, the 1560s and 1570s onwards, you get a movement which we now call Puritanism emerging in the Church of England. And these were men who were committed to trying to purify the worship of the Church of England yet further. We often think today of Puritan, when you say the word Puritan, it's a pejorative, it's a bad word. It means somebody who's always complaining about some program that's on television or the lyrics of some rap song or you know, somebody has a, I think H.L. Mencken says, a sneaking suspicion that somebody somewhere is having a good time. <laughs> well, Puritanism in the 16th and 17th century was simply those who wanted to see what they regarded as a more pure form of worship in the Church of England. And this will be the central struggle in English Reformation theology in the 16th and 17th century, the struggle over the Book of Common Prayer. And the Book of Common Prayer comes to be used really as a sledgehammer used by the government to control the people, essentially. It's a way of making sure that what is said and what is done in church is carefully controlled by the government. And that's important because in the 16th and 17th century, church wasn't just the place where you went on a Sunday. The sermon was the place where you learned about current events. 
The sermon was the place where you learned what was going on in the world and what your attitude to it should be. The sermon was not simply, if you like, exposition of the word. It was also the equivalent of CNN or something like that. Ministers were very, very powerful and influential political people. And that's why it was important for the government to control what they said. That's why the Book of Common Prayer, over the period of a hundred years, down to the early 1640s, becomes increasingly a means of restricting what is done in church, not liberating the people by bringing Protestantism to bear upon them. And John Owen emerges from the context of English Puritanism. His father was a Puritan vicar in the Church of England. From his earliest days, Owen would have been shaped by the debates and arguments that surrounded the nature of Christian worship. It's important to understand that for what I shall come on to say probably tomorrow in lecture uh, three or four about Owen's understanding of Christian worship. Shaped by his experience as a child, shaped by his father, a Puritan minister within the church. So the first thing I want you to grasp tonight then was the Reformation. The fact that the Reformation changes everything. It raises the pastoral bar and it transforms the nature of church as people experience it and know it. It raises new questions. How do I know that God will be gracious to me? Raises a whole host of new questions, puts new answers in their place. The second thing to grasp is this issue of worship. Puritanism is first and foremost a debate about the nature of worship in England. The third thing that is a factor on the development of Martin, Lu- uh, Martin Luther. You can see I spent half my time lecturing on Martin Luther and half on John Owen. The third factor that influences John Owen is the rise of what we call Reformed Orthodoxy. Sounds a terribly dry and dusty thing, Reformed Orthodoxy. What is Reformed Orthodoxy? It is essentially that development of Reformation theology that takes place after people like Calvin have passed from the scene. Calvin dies, the Genevan reformer dies in 1564. What happens after he's died? The kind of theology that he represents begins to truly establish itself in universities, in countries and in churches and begins to produce confessions. Begins to self-consciously think about how it stands in relation to other Christian traditions. And Reformed orthodoxy is the primary intellectual force shaping John Owen's thinking and theology. What is it? Well, first of all, Reformed Orthodoxy stands in a long line of theology that one finds in Western Europe. The title for this uh, conference, I think, is John Owen, Giant of Western Theology. First point to make about Reformed Orthodoxy is it isn't invented in the 16th century. We tend to think as Protestants that Everything changes in 1517. Luther goes up, nails his 95 theses against indulgences on the chapel door in Witten, castle door in Wittenberg and everything changes. Absolute rubbish. Luther was trained in medieval theology. Luther continues to interact with medieval theology over the years. The men who built the church in the 16th and 17th century trained at universities where the libraries were full of medieval books. You simply can't have a year zero. I said earlier, everybody's shaped by the generations and the forces that went before them. And Reformed Orthodoxy is no different to that. Reformed Orthodoxy picks up many ideas, and we'll talk about these more in the second lecture, many ideas that have been there from the early church, carries them forward and develops them. And it's very important that Reformed Orthodoxy does that because one of the great differences between the 16th and 17th century times and today is if you came up with a new idea in the 16th or 17th century, the assumption was that it was wrong and bad. We live in a society that's very much built upon the present is better than the past and the future will be better than the present. We assume that the cars we'll be buying in 10 years' time will be better bigger, faster, more efficient than the cars we buy today. If I were to ask you, uh, you know, who here is wearing clothes that they bought ten years ago? Probably only the fashion victims among you would put your hands up. <laughs> most people, most people have bought clothes more recently. Why? The clothes you bought ten years ago, they worn out? No. 
but you just don't want to walk around in drain pipe trousers and winkle picker shoes today because you look ridiculous. Apologies to anybody wearing those particular items of clothing here tonight. Our culture is built upon the new being superior to the old. Nobody in you know, my, own field of, uh, my own field is the academic field. No academic makes their career by demonstrating that the guys got it right last generation. You make your academic career by demonstrating that they got it all wrong and it needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. So it's deep within our culture, popular culture, economic culture, intellectual culture, that the new and the novel is what we're aiming for. That is a virtue to be aimed for. In the 16th and 17th century, it's very, very different. If it's new and it's novel, it's almost certainly wrong. If it's new and it's novel, it's almost certainly heretical. If you find something in a biblical text that nobody's seen there before, the chances are nobody's never ever seen it there before because it isn't there in the first place. That's very much the mentality in the 16th and 17th century. So, the Reformed Orthodox context, the first thing it does is it demands that Protestantism connect with the past. And when you read John Owen's works, if you go to his commentary on Hebrews or you look at uh, his writing on sin or anything like that, you will be struck by the number of quotations he includes from people 100, 200, 300, 400, 1,000 years before he was writing. And it's important he does that because he does not want to be accused of novelty. Owen has this attitude that Christianity is not invented every Sunday. You don't go to church and reinvent the faith every Sunday as far as Owen is concerned. You go to church to represent the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And that places severe restrictions on the kind of novelty in which one can engage. So the first thing to grasp about that is Reformed Orthodoxy is not new or novel in many ways. It represents an attempt to take the past very seriously. And that's why I would say as an aside, don't think of John Owen as a sort of no creed but the Bible fundamentalist. There's a sense in which he has no creed but the Bible. There's a sense in which the Bible is the only supreme authority and the only authoritative source of knowledge of God. That's very, very true. But that doesn't mean for Owen that he doesn't need to read and listen very carefully to the testimony of the Church throughout the ages. The creeds and the confessions and the writings of the great theologians throughout the centuries are very, very important to him. Owen has this view that God has guided his church. The church is sinful and imperfect and makes mistakes and everything the church says must be tested by scripture. But the reformed orthodox would have considered you an idiot if you just sat down with your Bible and tried to think it all up. You can do that if you want. But if you're going out to buy a car, you're not going to reinvent the wheel yourself. You're going to assume that somebody else got the design quite well. If you drive along the road and your car's juddering up and down, you've got a good reason for saying, well, this wheel is not designed well. But on the whole, you're going to work with what one might call, to use a sort of pompous theological language, a hermeneutic of trust when it comes to buying cars. And Owen works with a hermeneutic of trust when it comes to testimony of the church throughout the ages. Reformation abandons church tradition only at those points where the church tradition is incapable of making sense of scripture. On the whole, it will accept a lot of church tradition because it allows you to make coherent sense of scripture. So the first thing about reformed orthodoxy then is it connects to the past. Second thing about it is it connects to the present as well. When you read John Owen, when you look at his works, this is a man who is intimately involved in the culture and the affairs of his day. One of my favourite anecdotes, well the two, I have two sort of anecdotes about John Owen. One of them is that um, yeah, he would not have put up his hand and said he was wearing clothes that were bought ten years ago. He used to get rather nice Spanish leather boots imported from Spain and they came up to about here on him. They were thigh boots and he would strut up and down the high street in Oxford and people used to complain that Owen spent too much time addressing his own fancy appearance 
more than was uh, appropriate for uh, a man of the cloth. The other uh, anecdote that plays to this is, well, is a speech that was given at the University of Cambridge and like Harvard and Yale, there's no love lost ever between Oxford and Cambridge but when Owen was Vice-Chancellor at Oxford, his counterpart at Cambridge made a speech to the effect that Owen put enough powder in his hair every morning to prime seven cannons. I'm assuming that's a considerable amount of hair powder. But triviality aside, Owen and his colleagues they read very, very widely. They read very, very widely and engaged very widely with the culture in which they found themselves. If you get hold of Owen's... um, Sadly, when he died, his library was broken up and his books were sold off. But a catalogue, an auction catalogue of his books was produced uh, called the Bibliotheca Oweniana, 1684. And it lists all the books he owned. And he owned books on everything. Not only did he own theology books and biblical commentaries, He had a massive library of contemporary heretical works. He had books on geography. He had books on physics. He had books on chemistry. He had books on medicine. He even had a section on home brewing. He had books on home brewing. He would not have been eligible for ordination, certainly in the RPCNA of 30 years ago. He may have (laughs) slipped in uh, today. But um, very, very widely read. Reformed orthodoxy, John Owen very well connected with the culture of his day. So the first, I say, the first point is he's connected to the past. Second thing is, this is a man who's very, very well connected to the present. Again, I say, don't think of him as a kind of no creed but the Bible fundamentalist. This is not a man who would refuse to read the newspapers in case he was corrupted. This is a man who read the equivalent of the newspapers so that he could speak relevantly to his day and generation. When he writes theology, he writes theology that addresses the issues of his day. Yes, he's connected to the past. Yes, he has a healthy respect for the past. But he applies that past to the present. He doesn't simply engage in a recasting of the past as the past over and over again. Third aspect of Reformed Orthodoxy. It represents a far more sophisticated theology than one finds in people like John Calvin. We shall again deal with this more in the second lecture. But Reformed Orthodoxy, anyone who reads Owen will notice straight away, it's a lot more hard going than reading the Institutes of John Calvin. Um, One of the reasons for that is, I think Owen, my own conviction is he was clearly bilingual. He could clearly operate as comfortably in Latin as he could in English. And one of the things I think that happens is when when you are very, very competent in two languages like that and that the grammar, syntactical structure of the one language can flow over into the other. And there are times when Owen writes English as if it was Latin. That's the problem. Jim Packer has a great tip for when you're reading Owen and the sentences are just too long and complicated. Packer says, read them out loud because there is a rhythm to the prose. It reads very nicely and if you read it out loud you can grasp the sense by feeling the rhythm of the prose itself. My mind's gone temporarily blank for a second there. Yeah, sophistication, sorry. Yeah, it's awful when that happens. More awful for me, believe it or not, than it is for you. The other reason for the sophistication of thinking is the world is a much more complicated place in the 17th century than it was in the 16th century. In the 16th century, you have, certainly to begin with, a fairly straightforward fight between Protestants and Catholics. And the issues are relatively few in number and relatively clearly defined. Protestantism splits and becomes Lutheranism and Reformed. So you have debates within Protestants that start to develop fairly early on in the 16th century. By the time you come to the end of the 16th century, the situation is far more complex. Protestantism is beginning to shatter. And one of the uh, things about Protestantism is it has proved itself over the years to be a very fragile and easily fragmented movement. And as Protestantism has fragmented, it's become a lot more complicated because the issues of defining yourself over against other people and the debates that get thrown up 
become more complicated. You're no longer defining yourself simply over against Roman Catholics. You're defining yourself over against Lutherans, over against Arminians, over against Sassinians. Don't worry about the terms, we'll come to them in lecture two. The situation becomes a lot more complicated and that requires a more complex and a more rarefied approach to theology than one had before. Distinctions become finer. Now, it's often tempting when we're dealing with theology and fine distinctions to say, oh, this is all, it's pointy-headed, policy wonk kind of obscurity. Remember, these men are almost all pastors. The issues are fine and complicated, but if you track them back, they almost all connect to the ordinary life of the church in some way. Often used as an example, when I teach the early church uh, at Westminster and we deal with the Trinitarian controversies of the 3rd and 4th century and it gets pretty complicated. But the bottom line is, if Christ is not God, he cannot save. And all of the complexity of the 3rd and 4th centuries comes back to a very, very simple point. Well, I want to say two very simple points. If Christ is not God, he cannot save and you are baptised in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't get more basic in the Christian life than the God who saves and baptism. When you come to the 17th century, you have equally complicated debates to those that you had in the 3rd and 4th century. And they may appear obscure. But on the whole, on the whole, they track back to things that are of critical importance. And that's why I want to make a, a, a small distinction here between what I couldn't call confessional debates and non-confessional debates. Fourth aspect of Reformed Orthodoxy is it formulates confessions. In the 1560s you have the Heidelberg Catechism, you have the Belgic Confession, you have the Second Helvetic Confession. In the 1640s you have the Westminster Confession produced. Confessions were documents that gave very, very clear statement to the Christian faith. And the amazing thing about those confessions is how broad they are on many points. Reformed orthodoxy did not require absolute agreement among all its adherents on every single point of doctrine. What it did was it produced these documents called confessions that laid out the basics, the important things, the essentials, one might say, of the faith. Debates took place within Reformed Orthodoxy but the bounds were set by these confessions that are really remarkably broad and Catholic documents in many ways. So the fourth aspect then of Reformed Orthodoxy is confessional nature. Time is pressing on and I wanted to say something about Owen's life in brief to give you some measure of the man. So say he was born in 1616. He comes to prominence in the 1640s. The 1640s are the era of the Westminster Assembly, the assembly that is called by Parliament in order to sort out the kind of problems that the uh, the, uh, uh, Anglican Book of Common Prayer had generated. Owen is not a member of the Westminster Assembly because he's simply not old enough. He comes to prominence in 1643. The Assembly starts in 1643. He's simply too young and junior to get in, if you like, at that point. In 1649... The Civil War, or as uh, as the the Scots would now tend to call it, the War of the Three Kingdoms, because Scotland and Ireland also played crucial roles in what English scholars have generally called the English Civil War. In 1649, the King, King Charles I, was executed. Now, if you can imagine, um, I mean, Watergate would have been a fairly traumatic experience, I would guess, in the American psyche. The impeachment, the resignation of a president on corruption charges or whatever they were. Fairly traumatic. The execution of a king in a society that was used to thinking of the king as God's civil representative on earth, that's cataclysmic. That's huge. The man chosen to preach to Parliament the day after the king's execution is John Owen. It indicates that between 1643 when he published his first work and 1649 This is the man who has risen to huge political prominence within English society. And on the day after he's preached that sermon, he goes to pay his respects to a man called General Fairfax, 
General Fairfax was the military leader of the parliamentary armies. And while Owen is waiting in the, uh, the reception area of Fairfax's uh, house, another man comes in and meets him and makes his acquaintance and this man is called Oliver Cromwell. Those of you who know anything about uh, English history will know that Oliver Cromwell goes on to become what we call the Lord Protector in the 1650s, effectively the military dictator of England after the overthrow of the monarch. Owen and Cromwell will become firm friends for some years. Owen will be Cromwell's chaplain on his infamous tour of duty in Ireland. Owen will also be Vice-Chancellor of the University of Oxford, the man who hires and fires in the university. Considering he's a Puritan, and Puritans are meant to be sort of killjoy lunatic extremists, it's very interesting to see who Owen hires when he's in Oxford. Owen clearly hired people who were sympathetic to the king and to the monarchy. But he hired them because they could do the job well. He appears to have been a very, very moderate vice-chancellor of the University of Oxford. He falls out with Cromwell in the late 1650s when Cromwell, it is suggested to Cromwell that he make himself king and Cromwell hesitates before he refuses the offer. The significance of that is Owen is a radical republican in the English sense of the word. Not the, no, don't think Abraham Lincoln, Ronald Reagan or whatever. Think Republican with a small r, anti-monarchist. The fact that Cromwell could even hesitate when asked such a question is enough to spoil the friendship. And when Cromwell dies and is buried, Owen doesn't even attend the funeral. The significant absence from the funeral is John Owen who isn't even invited to attend. In 1660, Charles II son of the executed Charles I, returns uh, the request of Parliament to take back the monarchy and England once again returns to rule by a monarch. Charles II is obviously not well disposed towards the Puritan party, whom he holds responsible for the execution of his father. And Charles II puts in place a series of fairly brutally repressive rules and laws called the Clarendon Code that culminate in 1662 with what is called the Act of Uniformity. The Act of Uniformity is a parliamentary act that requires every minister in the Church of England not only to use the Book of Common Prayer in worship, but also to accept that the Book of Common Prayer is good, godly and wholesome. And it's the acceptance of that that is the bridge too far for almost 2,000 men in the Anglican Church. And on the anniversary of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and the choice of date is very significant. It would be like doing something on September the 11th in America. It's a very, very significant date that this legislation comes into enforcement on. On the anniversary of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which was this terrible massacre of Protestants in France the previous century, almost 2,000 men, including John Owen and Richard Baxter, leave the Church of England. And Puritanism, in many ways, comes to an end at that point. The struggle within the Anglican Church is over. It's finished. And English nonconformity is born. And Owen will spend the next, well, the remainder of his life really, ministering to relatively small congregations in the environs of London. Um, he was a very urbane and well educated man. It appeared that he still enjoyed some favour at court, even with his radical views. Charles II would sometimes ask him for his advice, most famously. Um, asked him for, to comment on John Bunyan. Um, Owen was also given money by Charles II to distribute to the poor at times. Um, he was also involved, it would appear, with uh, what I suppose we would now call radical terrorist groups. His house is raided and he's found to be stashing firearms in the attic of his house. It appears that he continued to keep up contact with radical Republican revolutionary groups we can only speculate about these things. It is the nature of radical Republican revolutionary groups that they don't leave paperwork around for you to be able to reconstruct who they were and what they were doing. But we do know that Owen was involved in some way with some fairly extreme elements in the 1660s, 1670s. Um, But his major work of this last year was his huge commentary on the Book of Romans which I think I, I, I'm right in describing as probably the most thorough and expansive commentary on the book of, uh, sorry, book of Romans, book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews um, 
ever written and probably the greatest pre-critical commentary on Hebrews, I would guess. And also his major work on the Holy Spirit about which we shall have more to say tomorrow. So John Owen then, his context, very much that of the pastoral traumas caused by the Reformation, the worship wars in England. His thinking is shaped by Reformed orthodoxy and his life is shot through with the radical politics and tumultuous events of his time. Time is now quarter past eight. I think that's the time for our first break. And we'll reconvene at half past eight. Okay. <laughs>